Hello, thank you for joining us. Welcome to this webinar event. This is one of many such webinar-based professional development events brought to you by Texas Instruments Australia as part of our ongoing support for teachers in the classroom. Today's topic, specialist mathematics, just plain vectors, and your presenters are Rodney Anderson and Peter Fox. My name's Brian Lannan and I'm your host for the event. And let's just take a look at the description for this event. Just plain vectors, some of you may have wondered a bit about. One direction may have been popular, but three are better. The TI and SPI can handle vectors in three dimensions, plain and simple. In this webinar, we will use a mixture of dynamic visuals and matrices to explore a range of vector problems. Now, we're all mathematics teachers here, but I think I know enough about the English language to recognise some fairly dodgy puns when I see them. I think it's the last sentence of that description is the only one not containing a pun. Um, I'm not going to uh, ask any questions about who's responsible for that. I'm just going to quickly introduce our first presenter, Peter Fox. Good evening, Peter. Hi, Brian. Um, it's actually Rodney who's going to be our first presenter, but I can chat on his behalf. That's fine. <laughs> I've, got, I've got both of you lined up. I just thought uh, somebody might um, have their face appear on the screen just after showing all those puns. Um, he's better looking than oh, I am, yeah. that's for sure. <laughs> and, and we see here that um, Peter works with Texas Instruments, providing training for teachers, producing educational content and supporting product development. He's taught high school mathematics and physics for more than 25 years and has been making bad puns for even longer. Peter is passionate about the appropriate use of CAS technology and has supported programs in Australia and New Zealand. Is that a correct description, do you believe, Peter? Certainly the bit about making puns longer than, well, actually, I think we should have corrected that, attempting to make puns. <laughs> Very good, thank you. Uh, and our uh, first presenter, well, our second listed presenter here, but our first presenter that we'll be hearing from this evening is Rodney Anderson from Moreton Bay College in Brisbane. Good evening, Rodney. Good evening, Brian, Peter and all. And Rodney is, uh, as you see, a senior teacher at Moreton Bay College where he's been for a while. He's been teaching with uh, TI calculators since way back in the good old days of the TI-81, right through to the current Inspire platform. He uh, has a particular focus on using Navigator in the classroom uh, with his students, self-paced units, revision and assessment content. It's absolutely brilliant for, uh, for assessment and quickly gathering data from students. Um, and I think one of the best things that I see from Rodney is the way that he's always willing to and very capably sharing his uh, expertise with fellow teachers. So thank you, Rodney. Thank you. Enough from me. Let's hear from you, Rodney. Thank you, Brian. Well, first of all, it's going to be plain and simple the first portion and complex as we progress. So I thought I'd get a few puns in <laughs> first, Peter and Brian, so apologies to the listeners as we go through to get some in there. So. So just as listeners, as we go through, there'll be hidden puns. So not for me, probably more from you, Brian, I'd say. Would there, would. So I'm using the non-CAS version, as you see on the screen. And um, I'm actually, as you said, talking about plain and simple. The first portion might think, oh, I'm watching this. I know how to do this. But it's always good to actually review a few things, see the few skills, do things differently, and um, enjoy the webinar. So we're going to be defining and storing vectors. It's the same on the CAS as well as the non-CAS. And obviously with vectors, we're looking at the i, j, and k components. So, so most textbooks use the uh, column vectors, but we'll probably just look at the row vectors at the moment, my first portion. And first of all, how matrices ended and defined. So as I said, you can store a vector as in a variable. So what we're going to look at is just a few things as a reminder to the audience. With the capital keypad, and I select number five, it's always good to have a look through this one here. Just as we've seen a few things, if I use the nav pad and have a look around, you'll see what they are and the name of it. So if I actually go back to the left, and if I just pop down, you'll see we've got the two by two matrix. We actually have the one by two and so forth. We keep on going and we have the n by n. So as I said before, the vectors are entered into the 
computer slash calculator as if it was a matrix. So first of all, I look at 3i, 2j, and 5k. So if you have something like this, the M by N matrix, just to show the audience, remind a few people, if I just press enter, we want to create maybe a three by three matrix, and we click on OK, we can start entering. We might want to say seven. To move to the next entry line, we can just press tab, or use the arrow keys. Might want to go negative three. Got the idea, so I don't want that. So I want to actually clear the whole line. I'm going to go control clear, just as a quick revision. So I'm actually going to store <coughs> Uh, three columns by the one row. So if I go to the catalog again, I'm back to the M by N matrix. So the good thing about the software, which you've used lots of, will stay there. So I'm actually going to select enter, and I'm going to have one row. Oops, I'll go back to the top. One row, tab down, three columns, and we'll actually have the first one. So as I said, we're going to have three, tab across, two, tab, five, go outside. Now, I'm going to show you a few things about storing. So what some of the students like doing, they like using the control store. So control, store, and matrix A or vector A as we say. So that's done. So we've entered that one. So what can we do now? So we look at that one and we've actually stored as matrix A or vector A. So how about the matrix menu? So let's have a look at the menu. And often say to the students as the teachers, I say, where would matrices be? So obviously matrices and vectors, number seven. So I need to just don't say seven, I use the words. And create, and we want to create a matrix. And there we have again, so we have one row, tab down, make it three. Now, See how I've actually put the matrix so I thought, oh, I wanted to find it another way. So what I'm going to do is come back to here. I might want to start, store this as a vector B. So I'm going to say B and go Control and the Define. So, and tab in. And then I'm going to say it's matrix. It's got 4i, 7j, and 3k. And we have it. So we've actually defined the two matrices or two vectors and if we want to make sure, let's have a look. So we have the variable keypad, and we see that we actually have stored two vectors. So we escape out of that. And so we've actually defined the matrices that way. So let's have a look at the manual entry. Some people like to use this as well. So another way of looking at this, let's create vector C and go Control Define or use the Define command. And if you'd actually look at these brackets down here, so with the control square brackets, what we're going to do here is going to do the manual entry. So what I'm going to do is go three, comma, two, comma, five. That's lovely, isn't it? So we've got many ways of doing a few things. So just as a reminder, what you feel comfortable with, well, you just do that with that. So for them, I'm in class with the students, so I'll say, do what's best for you. I'm show you a few methods. A beautiful piece of software and calculator. So you need to actually use what you feel most comfortable. So as I said, we can see that. So what if we actually had? I want to add vector A to vector B. So what we could do is actually press the variable keypad, select A. It's bold, so we've defined it, and we add B. And if we add the two vectors together, that's what we should get, shouldn't we? Now, as with this calculator, I could just use the keypad down the bottom. So what I could do is just add vector B and C together. So obviously I could just come down here and go B, add C, and we get that. Now, the little thing I like doing with students, I said, what about vector D? So let's all press D. And obviously they say it hasn't been defined, it's not, as it's, italics not as a, a, a vertical or bold. So it's very important they recognize that so it hasn't been defined. So we've actually used, just using the keypad. Now, if I actually insert a notes application, I like using control I for insert, insert a notes application. We've actually got the two applications in the one document. If I hit the variable keypad again, it still can be used in here. So if I actually select a 
class B, you'll see that I'm actually adding the two vectors together within a math box. And if I press enter, there we have it there. So it's linked across the two applications just as a reminder for people. So we're adding, subtracting. It's quite easy to do that with the situation. Now visualization. So on the Texas Instruments Australia website, that these resources and files will be accessed on the website. Also, they'll be sent to you as part of the documentation at the conclusion of this webinar. There is a lovely application through Vectors Introduction. So if we go across to page 1.2, you can because you're using software, it's quite easy to click across. If you're on the handheld, control right for the new people. So we can see the visualization. So about adding vectors head to tail. So obviously we want to add A and B. So we're just reinforcing about head to tail. So I've got vector A. I want to add vector B. Show that it equals vector C. So we actually come back to the start. And that's just beautiful visualization. There's many other files like that, but this is a very simple one to reinforce about the representation. Now, if I go across to 1.3, as you see, I let people read the, the screen, parallelogram rules. So that show that A plus B equals C and B plus A is equal to C. So obviously, we can just do the same thing. Obviously, it's been identified for the uh, subscripts for us, A1 plus let's add B1 to it. And back to C. That's lovely, this one here. So what about if I say B plus A? So if I actually go B plus A, and if I actually move it down here, I can move the C across. What we could do, what we should do, is look at the parallelogram rule. Let's actually move it across, and we end up with the same resultant vector. And it's just lovely, very simple process. Now, obviously with another visualization, as you see here with this file, it's being created with the vectors and we've actually got sliders here. So we can do the same thing. Even though it's, we've got the vectors, I'll just move it to the point here. So what I might do is actually put it on the y-axis to start with, or sorry, j-axis to start with. And I can move b around to here, just talking about the relative size of Vectors, and as it comes into close, you'll see that the result of the vector here is the C. So, a lovely application. So, if you use the slider, it just reinforces about what's happening with the I components. And the next one is with the J components. And if we keep on going, we'll see it all together. And we actually have our resultant vector with some of the, the files. Now, with these particular files on the TI Australia site, and also with the um, TI USA website, they often have TNS files, PDFs, uh, Word documents, answers. It's lovely. And so the resources are there. So instead of reinventing the wheel, so we've got lovely diagrams. So white page 1.5. We can keep on going through and looking, talking about, as you saw, without defining vectors and with this particular document. And we can keep on going through with all those ones there. So let's go back to the original document. So here we go. So let's have a look what's actually inside the menu item of in a calculate application with matrices. It's just for the new people who may be watching this video or new to the TI Inspire. So we can't assume everybody is an expert at it or been using a long period of time. So select the matrix and vector menu and just stop and have a look here. So obviously I was thinking when I do the webinars and talk in class, I say to the students, use your common sense, how the menus operated and should look at that. So we've got the transpose, we've got the determinant, obviously, for the matrices, but there's nothing there about vectors, but there's something about a down at our key there. So what I often say to students, instead of going all the way to the bottom, let's go to the top, let's go to the vectors. And if we open that menu, let's have a look, what have we got there? So isn't that fantastic? So we can calculate the unit vector, the cross product, the drop product, convert the polar. So just remember here in this situation that I've actually used in the non-CADS calculator. So if you're actually determining the, um, the angle between vectors and um, doing a whole lot of calculations, it will come out to the decimals, but there's other ways of getting around with that one there with some people use the CAS uh, version. So if I escape out of that, there you've looked at what's there. And if escape out again. So obviously, let's escape out of that again. Something very simple, what if I want to transpose um, matrix C or look at um, vector C? So what I could do is press C, 
the menu. Matrix and vector, I'm a simple bloke, I like number seven there. And transpose. Isn't that just lovely to see? You can see it straight away. It's a good visualization. And and obviously with the magnitude of a particular vector. So what we can do, let's have a look. So we want to actually do the magnitude of the vector. So menu, often say to people, where would it be under? So select matrix and vectors. And you think it's got to be the magnitude. And there's something a little bit different here. So select norm. So we select number seven again. And we select the magnitude, the norm. So let's pick vector B. And you'll see here in the non-CAS, it will come out to the decimal form. So the CAS will be out with the third form, and you'll see it go through there. So looking at the time there, so I promised Peter that I'd try and give him most of the time for him because as he's looking at quite a few good things with the CAS version and also going on to... Um, types of exam questions and linking all things what I've done and reinforcing that we can give a bit more time. Now, <clears throat> obviously with the dot product, we can work out the dot product of two uh, vectors there. So we could, let's have a look at that. So where would it be under? You think, okay, it's not there, so it must be under the vectors. So select a vector and dot product. And we want dot product of, say, a and B, so A and the commas down the bottom left-hand corner, and B, there we are. And obviously if we've got time, we could actually work out the angle between two vectors. And if you wanted to, we could do that. So very quickly, if you know your um, formula, and let's see if you can visualize what I'm about to do. So what I'm going to do is select the trig, inverse cos. Now, with my students, if I see a fraction on this page, I like to see a fraction on the calculator. So I go control, divide, and I need to find the angle between A and B. I don't want to do that again. So what I'm going to do is go up arrow one. I don't want to copy that. I could, but if I want to copy that and press enter, it's there. And let's go to the denominator and we go menu, matrices, uh, select seven for norms. I want them. The norm of vector A outside of that, and I need to multiply, and I do the same thing again. Make it nice and easy and slow. Seven norm, but if I didn't do that, what I could do is show the participants. If I just go N O R, you think okay, M, then I could actually type it in, and I can do. B as I'm typing the keyboard, and if I press enter, there we have it. Now, obviously with a whole lot of things <clears throat> with the catalogue, as I said before, I always reinforce with people, students and uh, fellow teachers is actually with the catalogue, I actually look through here and remind myself what's there. If I escape out of that, you, if you actually look at the templates, if I press that keypad, with this one here, you know your, your template. You don't need to go control or use a catalog and move it around. You could come through here and select that one there and press enter. So you do the same thing as before. And just as a reminder, as one of the um, participants reminded me, they often do, you say to the participants, is that obviously all the menus, but number one's the most important ones in alphabetical order. The best thing about with this one, if I press N, and go down and find the norm, you'll see as we go through, it's actually got the syntax for each of the commands. So, so nearly there, there we are, norm of the matrix. So looking at the time there, Brian, I'll leave it to you and pass it over to Peter. I hope everybody enjoyed the introductory bit to the matrices and vectors and vectors and commands, and Peter will just extend that further. Terrific. Yep, yep. Um, thanks very much there, Rodney. I. Um I particularly like those dynamic visuals that you started with, you know, the, uh, yeah. the head-to-tail vector edition, and then, of course, going into the, uh, the catalogue and the templates for, uh, for, for work with, well, not just vectors, but also matrices in general. That is that's just so convenient and, uh, and useful. And I know I can see on Peter's screen that he's, uh, he's lining up to do, uh, to do some more of the same as well. Uh, I also know that Peter's, um, a lot of what Peter's demonstrating is also available 
to download those activities from the um, from the uh, TI website. So I will type into the uh, chat screen the link for that uh, for people who want to uh, follow on with this. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rodney um, and Peter. Thanks, Brian, and uh, thanks to all of those people that are putting some information in on the chat and Rodney for his introductions. I thought what I'd do is quickly go through a reminder of the things that Rodney's done um, because students need to be refreshed on these sorts of things. So a couple of quick reminders and these sorts of things I would always get students to write in their notes. Uh, certainly in Victoria they're allowed to take in a book of notes but uh, it's something that they do need to practice. So norm, that's just the magnitude. It'd be nice if it said magnitude. You could pretty define it that way, I guess. Um, and another one which Rodney covered was the dot product. That's an easy one to remember, at least that one seems logical. So it depends on what you've got defined. Now the difference between the CAS and the non-CAS here is in the non-CAS version of INSPIRE, you can only put numerical values in there if you're going to calculate the dot product. But I will demonstrate, um, I'm not going to say a workaround, but some interesting ways you can get around uh, the non-algebraic space there. Um, because we can define vectors, strangely enough, as functions, which we'll have a look at. Uh, transpose, as Rodney said, if you're, I find it personally easiest to put them in a horizontal or a row matrix. That's often done on websites because it's easier to code whereas your uh, column matrix is a bit harder, but I think you'll find most textbooks tend to use column matrices. Uh, unit vector is another one. The only thing that I find annoying with the unit vector, as you can see from the sample on the screen, is it would be nice if it brought out 113, or 1 on 13, and left it as 3, 4, 12 inside the matrix in that case. Uh, there's no easy or simple way to do it except if it was a multiple choice question then tell the students we'll just multiply it through but it should be obvious by looking at that that it, 1 on 13 can come out the front. Um, cross product, something that is not on the Victorian curriculum but is in the Queensland curriculum if I'm reading it correctly and I've got an interesting visual. Um, remembering of course this is done on a handheld but uh, we do have cross product in there. I think it's more important in the sense that the students know what that is, an interpretation of it. Um, the other thing I'm going to cover is some tips, that is the use of the notes application for doing some automated calculations. I know in the past my students would, uh, when I say past because I'm in the office, TI office now, but in the past I had students using the notes application so that they were able to quickly throw in some values and not have to jump through hoops or menus in order to get some results. If you're doing that on the computer software, make sure you're not doing every single possible variation of it because it will actually slow the calculator down as it turns through all of your calculations like the projection of A in the direction of B and the reverse and the dot product and the unit vector. Keep it simple. Um, so notes application is good. Uh, a widget. If you've never used a widget before, uh, Craig Brown, I noticed, is on this evening. If I was nasty, I'd transfer uh, pre presenter rights to uh, Craig and he could take over there. But a widget, probably a notes page, is going to be your simplest widget where you can save it. And just think of it as putting a file within a file. So if you've got a notes application that, let's say, does the dot product of two vectors, not that you'd want one that simple, then you can save that as a widget. Uh, you'd want something a little bit more complicated than that. Or the other one is you can write a program. Now the advantage of writing a program is that it makes the entry and change of things very quick and of course you can access them uh, very quickly and easily through your variable menu. So having a program to do stuff is also very useful. It takes up a little bit less room on your calculator as well and is normally pretty quick to respond. And most of the stuff that we're doing here can be done very quickly. The entry of the vector is easy too. If you're doing it as a program, you can uh, just prompt for the three different components. And finally, a tip particularly for those doing uh, vectors with their CAS calculator is you can actually define variables as functions. And depending on how much time we have, I'll show you how to do that and some interesting ones there for things like vector calculus. So. What I thought I'd do first off is give you a sample examination question, uh, not that I want everyone to tackle it now, but we've covered most of the 
commands, or I've covered all of the commands that we need to cover this, but what I thought I'd do is show you how we can combine those commands and then also um, put them onto a notes application so you can see that the result could be automated. Now hopefully I've still got my piece of paper with those variables on, otherwise I'll have to skip and jump between the PowerPoint slides. The thing, the thing that disturbed me about this one is less than 50% of the students got this question correct. Um, I would suspect that some of them have probably done the reverse. Uh, I think one of the answers there from memory is the reverse, that is the vector resolutive view in the direction of V. Um, so the first thing, if you were doing a multiple choice question, is I'd be saying to the students, well, it says in the direction of U. So therefore, I'd be crossing out option A very quickly. That's for the students that went in the wrong direction and also C, clearly in the wrong direction. Um, I'm not going to make the pun about one direction right now because that would just be wrong to do that. Um, yeah, and look, the other thing I do for students, and I'll do it quickly here, um, is I want them to understand what a vector resolute here. So here's my little cyclist. He's traveling along, let's say, at 10 meters per second. It's not lightning fast, but that's the general speed for him. And if he encounters a headwind, then it's fairly safe to assume that he is going to slow down, depending on the strength of that headwind. But this is an easy case where the headwind is going in exactly the opposite direction to the cyclist. Um, the next one, what if, on the other hand, the wind is coming from behind? In other words, a tailwind. Well, most students can figure that out pretty quickly. A five meters per second tailwind, we'll add that to the speed. We'll ignore the other physics that's going on there, such as rolling resistance. Now, what if we get a crosswind? That may or may not speed the cyclist up. It depends on the component that is acting in the direction of the cyclist. And this is what Vector Resolute is essentially all about. So there's no doubt that the crosswind could in fact speed him up if it's partly a tailwind, but also if it's partly a headwind, it will slow him down, but only by a little bit, not the full strength of the wind. So in other words, if we've got the cyclist as vector C and the wind as vector W, then we can break that up into components. And the vector resolute of W in the direction of C is that first arrow. And then the vector resolute of W perpendicular to C, which is often asked and is really no more difficult, it seems to throw students because they don't have their formula for it, um, is that one there. And depending on the exam question, sometimes they muck around with them a little bit and they give you angles, but generally speaking would have the formula you can see down the bottom there, the vector resolute of B in the direction of A, and with no angles mentioned. All right, so let's go back to some calculator stuff. Um, which one will we use? Let's start with the non-CAS version of the calculator, um, and I'll create a new document. And just in case you couldn't remember, vector A was equal to, and you'll see I'm not using the Templates, I'm just going to type it in direct, 2, comma, negative 1, uh, negative 2 rather, comma, 1. That was our first vector. Uh, the question said U, so I'll, I'll type it exactly the same way. Gives me a chance to demonstrate that you can copy and paste stuff as well. Uh, vector V was assigned equal to uh, 3 negative 6, and 2. Now, from memory, let's just jump back to that slide so we can go back to the actual question, this one here. Oh, it's taking a while to go back. Oops, there it is. So we have to find the vector resolute of V in the direction of U. So the direction of view, that's the thing I want to remember here. So we need to work out the dot product, but as Rodney pointed out, if you're doing a fraction, then use the control divided by shortcut or the mass templates. And the first thing we need to work out is the dot product. Now I'm typing these out, generally speaking, the students would um, 
pick them up from the menus. So we want the dot product of U and V. You can see U and V are bold because they've already been defined. And we want the magnitude, which our reminders told us. We want the magnitude, I think it is, of U, if I remember the question. And then we want the unit vector of U. And that was it. And less than 50% of students got it correct. Now, that's doing it straight from a calculator application. This is on the non-CAS Inspire, so quite achievable for students using non-CAS calculators. Let's have a look at the same thing, and I will copy that command when I get to it. But let's have a look at in a notes application. So in a notes application, you'll need to insert a math box first. So Control M is the shortcut, or if you're doing it through the menus, we can insert math box, and you see there the shortcut, control M. And again, we'll have U is assigned equal to 2, negative 2, and 1. You see it automatically drops another math box in for me, and we'll have V assigned equal to, I could have recalled them here, but what I want to show you is how flexible this space can be. And 2. And here's where I'm going to get lazy. I paid a time Copy. efficient, that's what it is. Yes, thanks Rodney. I, I think so, <laughs> efficient. Thanks. Now, I wouldn't stop there. If I was doing this for something I wanted to have an exam, I would say that this is the vector resolute, that's a bit hard typing with one hand, but we'll see how we go, resolute of V in direction which one? You. Yes, which, to, yeah, thanks, Rodney. <laughs> I'm just going to make them go bold like that. We could put little underlines on them, kind of make them look like, no, that's just wrong. Um, so why bother doing it in a notes application? Well, that's because when you get to the exam, they're probably not going to have an identical question. But you can see we can swap it out pretty quick. It's already changing it and redoing it for me. And I'm done. So if they were the two vectors, I've now got the vector resolute of V in the direction of U for the new vectors, whatever that one was, on an exam. So how do I save that as a widget? Well, if you're watching the webinar a couple of weeks ago, you'd know, right? Or on the did other you... hand, we can go, what was that, sorry? I was just gonna say, did you just read my chat message? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> um, so there's a widgets folder on your calculator, and I'll call this one, I've got a silly widget there. I'm going to call this one Vector Resolute, for whatever reason that might be. Now, here's the thing you've got to be careful with a widget. It only saves one page. It saves your current page. I'm on the notes page. I'm good to go. Um, Peter, can I just suggest it? Don't, not current page, but yeah. the first page. Ah, oh, sorry, page the first page it is, thank you. Yep, so let me fix that. Otherwise, it's a silly old calculator page, which you could just go back and do anyway. Um, so let's just save that again. The silly Oops. old calculator page calculator isn't, isn't so silly. Um, it's just not as uh, fluidly editable as the... Um, as That's the, right. No, Correct, yeah. So, so that's the resolute what... save. Yep. Yep. So Peter deleted the so first I'm... page or making the second yep. one the first page. Is there the other option, yep. of course, so is to reorder. So if I was reorder. in a, um, yeah, if I was in a new document, I can now add a widget. I won't add my silly widget, but I could add my um, vector resolute widget. And there it is. So if I change my values in here, Make sure you press enter too, because you can see that they don't necessarily change until you press enter, and there it is. I've got my vector resolute of V in the direction of U. So that was the first one, and as I said, when we look at the results, when students did it, it was pretty sad, and that's all I had to do.
Let me go through my little wind diagram. Let's have a look at another exam question. Where is it? This one. Let A equal that and B equal that, where alpha is a real constant. If the scalar resolute of A in the direction of B is equal to that, then, oh, that seems a bit messy and ugly, doesn't it? So if you're already keeping up and you're happy with things as they are, I'm just going to write down those figures so that I don't have to memorize them. I've got vector A is 3i, 2j, and alpha times k. B is 4i minus 1j, and we've got an alpha squared. That's pretty bad, isn't it? But we can work around that. And it's the scalar resolute of A in the direction of B, and it's supposed to equal 74 over the square root of 273. And you have to figure out what alpha is. All right, so let's have a look. Uh, I think I did this one in the CAS one. Let's have a look. Nope. Nope, good. Got rid of it. Before I tackle it in the non-CAS, let's have a look at how simple it is in the CAS version. So I can make A assigned equal to, I'll go through the menus this time, just for those people who would prefer them. Create, number of rows, three, number of columns, oops, let's try one. And we had, three, two, and I'm not going to use alpha, I'm just going to use t, because it's quicker. And we've got four, negative one, I think it was. That's correct. And t squared. All right, so now if we're looking for the scalar resolute of A in the direction of B, I think was the question, we can do that as the dot product of A, and here's a nice little thing, I can actually put in unit vector B. Nice, isn't it? Isn't that pretty? <laughs> said no one. Um, and it said that we need that to equal, so we need to solve that expression, that thing, equal to and from memory, what I wrote down was 74 over, and I found this a little bit bizarre. Why would they have an irrational denominator? Why wouldn't they express that a better way? But never mind. And we want to solve that for t. That was it. So the big question is, can you do that and get that answer on a non-CAS? Well, we know that this part won't work because the non-CAS calculator will tell us that's an algebraic result and it can't produce it. Furthermore, if you try and enter a vector like that, it's going to tell you it can't do it because it doesn't know what t is. It needs a value for t. So you'd have a couple of options. One would be you could make t equal to some value and then just change it. That could be a slider or anything. Well, let's try it a different way and we'll see if it works. Uh, that's not the one I wanted. I want a new one. And we'll have A of T is assigned equal to, um, I think it was 3, 2, and T. So it's just a function. So in other words, if I wanted something like that, it just substitutes 3 in. So it's okay to define something as a function. So that means that B of T would have to equal, oops, be assigned equal to, and let's put in 4, negative 1, and T squared. And what we wanted to do was solve and, oops, that was a bit quick. I'll go back for that one. We want to do a numerical solve. 
and we had the dot product of A of T, and that's the difference here. You've got to put A of T in here because otherwise it doesn't know what it is. We're putting a function in there, and unit vector B of T. It's looking pretty ugly now, isn't it? That's our unit vector. We've got outside, and this is where it gets a little bit messy because you didn't know where things stop. And that has to equal 74 over the square root of 273. And we're trying to solve that for t. Happily, we've got the same answer. It's just a lot more work because we have to skip the middle step, the step that actually shows you the algebraic response, this bit here. So what we've done on the non-CAS is combine the two last steps there. We've put all of this in. If I was to do it down here, I'm saying solve and putting that bit in there and saying that equals. So it's a bit more work, but it can be done. All right, let's have a look at another exam question. Was there a question there, Brian? Um, oh, no, there was a there was another thing just based on uh, uh, labelling of pages within just within the mm -hmm. uh, the PI documents. But I'll, I'll I'll address that through a poll, Peter. You continue your okay your, your, your thing. Yep. So this one here is if A is equal to this one, B and M is a real constant, the vector A minus B will be perpendicular to vector B when M equals. Again, if I was going to do this on the non-CAS, I've got to define it as a function on the CAS. We can do without having to define it as a function. We can just put those in as values straight up with no need to uh, do any other weird and wacky definitions. Um, I'm just checking the time, see if we've got time to do that. Yeah, we could probably do that one. Let's jump across. We'll do this one on the CAS. Do I want to save that one? I'll just create a new one. And um, while people are asking about the page tabs, one thing I've noticed is some students just keep on adding page after page after page. Look, it's worthwhile if you're in an exam to keep the same document going or just hit control S. If your document's becoming too big and there's too much stuff on it, then you do have to be careful. If you've got only about 10 questions, one of the things I encourage students to do is use the doc and insert new problem. Yeah, so we don't And that allows very... them to go back. Yeah, go on, Brian. I was just going to say, so that we don't get any confusion with variables from one page to the next. That's exactly right. So in other words, I yeah. can use A again. I mean, you can be creative, but um, students I find tend to want to use whatever variables are, are given to them on the actual um, problem. Yep. So in this one, I can put in M1 uh, and 2. So again, I've, I've got no problem. And, and just to demonstrate, if I try and put that on the non-CAS calculator, let me see if it copies from one piece of software to another. Oh, look at that. And see, it says it's not a defined variable. That's because I haven't got anything defined for M. It doesn't let me do it. So I have to do it like this, where I'm going to define it as a function, and then it's happy. And then I can substitute values in it. All right, so the question says, M is a real constant, good O. Then it says, the vector A minus B is perpendicular to vector B. And by perpendicular, we know that the dot product is going to equal zero. So again, we can put a lot of this stuff into one thing. It depends on um, how confident the students are. But if we know the dot product of A minus B against vector B, we get an expression, and all we need to do is solve that equal to zero for M, and we're done. Luckily, about 70% of the students on the exam got that correct, but you can see there's not a lot that has to be done. 
and I'm not sure what part the students are messing up in. It just tells us well, once in the Victorian exams that students get above about the 60 or 70 percent of the students getting it correct, they don't tend to tell us too much about what the common mistakes were. But um, I'm sure just watching your students, you might be able to see it. Maybe they just didn't know how to do it. Um, not sure. All right, so moving on. This one I thought would be really cool. Show that for an object traveling in a circle, the acceleration is perpendicular to the direction of motion. I love this because I'm a physics person. <laughs> yep. So I'm going to make up a vector in terms of a function that would be traveling in a circle. Hmm. So to illustrate my point, because I might want to use A and B, I'm not actually going to use A and B, but I do want to insert another problem just to show people that on here, there's no variables. They're gone. I have to go back to problem number two to see my variables. There I've got them. The other thing which um, I don't know if Rodney mentioned, if I hit that variable button, you can see just to the left of it, they kind of look like matrices. So it's telling you this is a matrix. It's not a numerical value. It's a matrix. Because if I put something else in there, let's have C is assigned equal to 1. You can see that that gives a different symbol. So you can kind of tell what things are defined as from the variable menu. Now, which one was I? Here we go. So I want to show, so let's define V of T. We'll assign that equal to, and if it's traveling around in circles, we might put it as cos T and sine T. That would send this thing traveling around in circles. Of course, it could have some other amplitude. It could have some other translations, but I'm not particularly fussed about those. And I'm going to define the acceleration of t equal to, and a good colleague of mine uh, would be very happy with the fact that I use shift and minus to generate the derivative. Um, I'm not sure if he's on tonight, but um, just to go back if you're not sure where that is, you can to go back if you're not sure where that is, you can also pick that up from the templates. So we'll find the derivative of our velocity vector. And it says done. So now let's do the dot product of them. And I wonder what we'll get. So we've got the dot product of V of T and A of T. Oh, look at that, zero. As a physics person, I just love that. <laughs> that really that really floats my boat. So if you want to do that on the non-CAS, you can do those first two lines, no problem. But if you try and do the dot product, it's going to say, um, again, that it's got, can't do this algebraic thing. But if you put T in, if you substituted T, then you can put any value of t in that you like, and it pops out as a zero. It's not as convincing as this one, but uh, it, it works. Now, I'm wary of the time, so I thought I'd show people some more visuals, um, because we said that we'd uh, do some of those. We've done some question answering things. We've given people a tour of the vector commands. So I thought, let's do a visual. Now, this one is an example of uh, dot product, so students can kind of get some sort of an idea of what the dot product means visually. And then we'll have a quick look at cross product for teachers in Queensland, and I think that will just about wind us up. Um, so dot product, what does it mean? Now the kids can look them up on YouTube, but I thought I'd create a little investigation for students. So they can just drag B around. They can drag A as well, but I'm just dragging vector B around. And I can see the dot product is being shown along this little red number line here. So I can see that now the dot product is negative. So it's possible to get a negative value for the dot product. It's possible to get zero for the dot product, or one, or some other number. So now I'll have a look at how does A affect it. Again, in the opposite direction, if you like, or at uh, uh, an angle bigger than 90 degrees here, it's going negative, obtuse angle. So it seems that if I double the value of A, I'm doubling my dot product. 
and change in the angle. So the dot product is definitely dependent on the angle. I can see that. It seems to be dependent on the length of B and the length of A. And we know that because we know what the formula looks like with the dot product. So what we want students to eventually get to is this point P that's cast down here. At the moment, that's almost in line with our dot product. But if I change A, then we can see when P is about, uh, let, let's see if we can get P to be almost exactly 2. And we'll get A to be exactly 2. And then we get a dot product of 4. So in other words, and when you think about this logically, that if I did the magnitude of B, if I'm thinking geometrically, the magnitude of B multiplied by cos theta, of course that's going to give me the length of B in the direction of A, and then all I do is multiply it by the length A, and that's what our dot product means. So it's a nice visual that students can then experiment with and get an understanding, at the very least get an understanding of what things are involved in it and therefore have an idea on what that formula is actually doing. Right, cross product. This is my attempt at doing 3D vectors on the calculator. It's a little bit ugly. You'll notice that the diagram that Rodney had was all in two dimensions. That's because I think it's much easier for students to see what's going on. So if you want to do uh, linear dependence and independence, it's much easier to see that in 2D uh, than it is in 3D. But cross product really kind of calls for 3D because we're talking about a vector that's perpendicular to the plane of the two vectors. So in other words, if I'm doing the cross product of A and B, they form a plane, and our cross product is a vector that's perpendicular to that plane. So in my pretty ordinary sort of notation here, I've got some sliders for um, the I component of vector A, the J component of vector A, and the K component of vector A. And I can change them, and it changes my 3D drawing. So. Let's do something simple and put that along there and that along there. And you'll see now that the K component for our A vector is the only thing that exists. So it's got no X direction. In fact, if I press X on the keyboard, it jumps straight to an X rotation. If I press Y, it jumps straight to a Y. And you can see that that blue vector, which is my A vector, is going straight up and down the z-axis or in the direction k. I can't unfortunately label these i, j, and k. Um, if I introduce a j component, there it is there. On some angles it looks a little bit weird. Oh, we're starting to see the fact that it is coming into that other, that other, it's perpendicular to the plane though. That's coming out yeah, of Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Now, similarly, if I change my vector B, and if I put it on rotate, we can kind of see it there that our vector is perpendicular to the plane that is produced by the combination of vector A and B. So that's what the kids need to visualise. And I think without a 3D representation, that's pretty hard for students to imagine. It would be a little bit nicer if this was a nice smooth plane, but it's a calculator. And we need to understand that it's got a finite resolution on that screen. But I think there's enough there to show kids that we are, in fact, perpendicular to that plane. So hopefully that gives people an idea on the sorts of things you can do. Let me just stop that rotation. Oops. Stop rotating. There we go. Um, and that's just about it. Um, to make that vector, by the way, all I did was do some fancy work with, let me just see if I can get up into the equations. There they are. Oops. Menu and 3D graph, 
They're actually parametric equations that I did. So there's our parametric yeah. equations. So they're not too hard to create um, so that they change in length due to the slider length. But that's it, that's all they do. The reason why there's so many of them is because I've had to reproduce to draw that parallel because I wanted the um, parallelogram to appear because I found that when I only had the two vectors showing, uh, it was a little bit weird. It didn't quite look perpendicular, but once you've got that third vector, uh, the, the, the plane or the parallel, parallelogram rather, uh, it, you can kind of visualize where the plane is. But without it, I found it too difficult to visualize. Uh, if anyone's got an idea on how I might shade that plane in, that would be good because I think that would be even better. But I'm looking at the time and we're just about out of time, Brian, so I'll hand back to you, sir. Yeah, I've been, uh, thank you. I've just been uh, typing a few things into the uh, into the chat there. First of all, a link to the uh, to the lessons that people might want to download. Uh, and I think you wrote a few of those, did you not, uh, Peter, on, on vectors? Yeah, I've done some website. of those. <laughs> yep, yeah. uh, so that, that link has appeared in your chat screen. Um, and the other one, just on the 3D graphing, I know there's, there's a fair bit of interest about that. And um, I, I'll, just, uh, I'll just quickly looking through the, um, the catalogue of our past webinars, because I think we have used 3D, we have had webinars on 3D graphing in the past. In fact, Rodney, were you a presenter on one of those? I think I was. I'm just I was sort of sitting there thinking yeah, about yeah. that. So. Yeah, I haven't got time to chase it and put it in the chat now, but it, it, it um, if you look in the the archive of our past webinars, you could download that and uh, and take a look at some things on the on the three D three D graphing. Um, so that's about it for this evening. Um, thank you, thank you to both our panelists, Peter, Peter of the puns, uh, and some thing animations with the vectors and some activities for you to, to further download from the website. Um, and to Rodney, who really set us up well, I think, with the basics, not just for vectors, but also matrices in general. And I think together, the idea that we can get a lot of these uh, quick, quick calculated pages and store them as widgets, I, I think that's a terrific idea. And again, I think we've mentioned widgets a few times in webinars now. So uh, that's that's a useful feature for students. And also Peter tonight, sorry to interrupt Brian, showing about the non-CAS, the workaround for the space like in Queensland. Um, most students pick on the non-CAS facilities, so you can get those calculations done on the calculator. Yeah, and, and I think also in some of the IB, IB International oh, Baccalaureate, yeah courses the non cas and it's, it's it's a it's a lovely intuitive machine to use i think that it's um you know i'm i'm so used to ti inspire cas now but the non cas um it, 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 it it's almost as easy to use i think well it's uh, well actually it's probably even easier it hasn't got as ma as many commands um so before we close off and now is your your final opportunity to type in any any final questions of the presenters um, you can also, of course, use that facility to thank them um, and uh, words of words of encouragement and support. When we do close it, you'll get uh, you'll be taken to a page where we ask you for your feedback. Um, please do complete that because we we value your feedback and comments. And within the next couple of days, you'll be receiving in an email a box near you a link to take you to your certificate for participation. I continue to put up this slide, an invitation to you for in encouraging teachers to join us in our webinar program, if only for a short five, five minute or five to ten minute guest appearance sharing your idea. If that's something that you would like to do, we're all teachers, it's just teachers, teachers sharing good ideas from classroom practice with other teachers, if that's something that you would like to do. Please, please let us know. Type it into the chat now, or, um, or otherwise email me. You can see my email address at the bottom of that screen. If you wish to review this webinar, or go into the archives for other topics, or maybe sh share these webinars with your students, they're available via the on-demand section in our website, Texas Instruments Australia, 
or also via YouTube and our YouTube channel. You're probably already subscribing to the newsletter, which advises you of upcoming webinars. If not, or to share this with other teachers, the link is on your screen now. And if you have any other remaining questions, telephone numbers to the office, and there's a fair chance that even Peter might answer one of those phones. There is a good so, chance. <laughs> there is a good chance, yes. Um, so, once again, thank you to both our presenters this evening, Peter Fox from Texas Instruments and Rodney Anderson from Queensland, Moreton Bay College. Good evening to, to all and enjoy the rest of your evening. Cheers. That should have been and to all a good night. <laughs> to all a good, good night. night. That's it. Thank you.